I'm just sitting here with my buddy, uh, this is Bentley, and this is Nico, Crash, and this is their roadmap to success. And so basically, um, uh, these dogs, uh, Bentley uh, is, uh, well, really Nico, if you can see the blinds back there, has destroyed those blinds. Uh, the dogs basically, uh, Nico has a problem with dog reactivity, which is why the video above that we have is behavior adjustment training and how his guardian can actually create stage scenarios to help him practice calm behavior around other dogs, but what we call sub-threshold, or at a level where he is not worked up. You think of, uh, once a dog gets into a frenzy, it's almost like they're hysterical. If you have a human who's hysterical, you can't rationalize or talk to them when they're hysterical. You have to wait for them to calm down. So once a dog gets uh, what we call above threshold, come here, buddy, uh, you're not going to teach them anything. So you, when you practice, you want to make sure what you do in the video, as I talked about above, is we're going to make sure that we create a stage scenario where he feels comfortable. There's a dog present, but it's so far away, he doesn't perceive it to be a threat. But in this video, we're going to go over all the little tips and tricks that I covered in the session before we did the bat training. So um, one of the first things I asked the guardian was how much exercise they get. They, uh, they are not getting a lot of exercise. Uh, primarily because he's dog reactive and he's kind of a little bit like that as well. Thank you, buddy. Um, and so uh, uh, we'd like to exercise them more. Now I pulled out a laser and Nico was somewhat interested in the laser. Uh, wasn't chasing it too much. Some dogs they chase it as manic. It's not healthy for them to do it. Other dogs they chase it in an appropriate way. And it's, a, it's just a nice feeling to chase like a ball. Um, and that's a good way to burn some excess energy. Uh, another thing we might want to do is uh, is play fetch. You know, if we can teach the dogs how to play fetch, play fetch in the apartment is a great way to do it. Problem for him is he's dog reactive, so a lot of the options we would use we can't use. We take him for walks. He sees other dogs. He goes bananas. Um, his guardian can't take him to the dog park for obvious reasons. And uh, so there's other things we can do. Um, when I was, uh, I am, a, I try to be a pretty athletic person. I work out daily and, and do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but uh, the other day, or a couple of months ago, I sat down to prepare my taxes for tax season. I wasn't doing my taxes, I was preparing it for a bookkeeper. And I'm just kind of itemizing and putting stuff together. I sat down at my desk for six hours, I stood up and I was exhausted. I wasn't doing anything but sit on my butt. You would think I would have plenty of time or plenty of energy. I was using a different muscle. So for dogs, a great way to burn excess energy is to have them use their brain and their nose. And dogs' nose controls 60% of their brain. Well, dogs are great for scent. That's the dominant sense for dogs. Um, so one of the things that the guardian might want to do is play scent games. There are books on this. You might want to just Google it to start off and see if this is something that dogs respond to. So maybe we put uh, Nico in the kennel and we put Bentley in the bedroom and then we hide five treats in the apartment. Then I release uh, Nico and give him the command word hunt or seek or whatever it is. And then he goes and finds him. Every time he finds him, we come up with a command word and bingo means you found the treat or whatever it is. And he has to find those five treats using his nose. Now, at first, you make it pretty easy. You just put it around a corner, and he runs around the corner, and he sees it. But eventually, he's got to flip something over and do different things to earn it. This will make him feel better about himself because he's earning his affection, number one, or his reward, number one. Number two, he's using his brain, so we're depleting some excess energy. He's the one finding it, so it's a boost of self-esteem. And we talk about pawing. You can't paw for things anymore. You can paw, but they're not gonna, that's not going to work. That's going to be a light switch off. Uh, and so uh, this is a great way to deplete some excess energy as well. Now, if we have a set of stairs um, where we can do this safely, um, I like to use it like a Stairmaster. If you get a really long lead like we used in the bat training, if you have one for that, you might use it for stairs. Now, for stairs, you got to be careful we don't get entangled up. But a lot of people that have a multiple level house, I'll just take a treat and throw it down the bottom of the stairs. The dog goes to the bottom of the stairs and gets it. I say it would say maybe down. And then I, when the dog comes back to me, I would give it another treat and say up. And then I count that as one and then do it again, and eventually you get the dog to run up and down the stairs, and that's a great way to burn excess energy. Just like I said, if you're using a long lead like we used in the bat uh, behavior video, uh, make sure he's not getting tangled up on stairs. We don't want to get hurt. We just want to deplete some excess energy. So laser games, fetch, or whatever it is, keep on increasing his, his exercise until you get to the point where he feel you, he's, his behavior is better overall. And uh, there's things you might want to do, like start an exercise journal. Write the date at the, date of the top of a blank piece of paper, a uh, new page, then write a column for Bentley, a column for Nico. Then write down the time and how long the walk was, the time and how many fetches, the time and how many laser revolutions around the house, uh, the time and how many uh, scent games, or whatever these things are. This way, we, and then at the end of the day, and write down when you, when you feed him, and then if he has a barking incident, or the dog's getting a fight, or anything like that, write those things, the date and uh, the time of that, and what else is going on, the sights, sounds, and smells that were preceding, during, and after, well, really preceding and during. And at the end of the day, give each dog a letter grade, A through F. 
And then the next day, play around the variables. Maybe we have an extra game of fetch or the game of fetch that we do have, instead of fetching 15 times, we try fetching 20 times. Play around with the variables until eventually you're like, wow, that was like an A plus behavior day from Bentley and that was an A plus behavior day for Nico. Now there are different energy levels and different ages and different sizes. So what might work great for Nico is not gonna be appropriate for Bentley and vice versa. The idea is we just want to find the cocktail for success. We might have to take uh, Nico out for three more walks than we take Bentley. That's okay. Now Bentley's a little, uh, you're, not, you're a little rotund, buddy. We can lose a little bit of weight on him. And I, I went through uh, a structured feeding with the Guardian. That will help with that as well. Uh, and just look at the bag and maybe feed him a little bit less. Something else you might want to do is feed it, is take about 10% of his food away, what you're supposed to feed him, and get about four or five fresh green beans, chop them up into little bits and put that in his food. The fiber from the green beans will help him feel full, and that way you can take, feed him a little bit less and help him decrease his, his uh, rotundness. A little bit less jelly for your jelly roll. All right, now there's the window up here that I talked about is we're in, a, in an apartment and we overlook, we're upstairs, so we overlook uh, people walking around. He's dog reactive, and I think that he thinks that his job is to be in charge of protecting his human because she doesn't have any rules. Come, we'll talk about that in a sec. This is passive training. We'll talk about this in a sec as well. So if he's up here and the guardian's in the inner bedroom and he hears the dog and goes in there and barks and he snarls and he barks, bites him, he's, obviously you can see he's destroying some of the blinds, but also he's practicing aggression and he's practicing being a guard dog. Those are things that we don't want to do. We want to essentially demote him so he's no longer in charge of security. So what we would do is, we call this maintenance. We want to remove temptation. So what I have the guardian do is get some white paper, just go to Kinko's or uh, you know, Office Max or a place like that. They have a roll of paper, it's three feet wide, you can print a banner that's like 100 feet long, it says welcome back or whatever it is. Get one of those and put it on the outside of the window, tape it in there so that it's covering maybe up to about where that little plastic partition is, maybe halfway up the window. So this way, it acts as a filter. It allows light in, because it's just paper, it's just diffusing it. But every time that Nico goes there and looks out, he can't see on the street. And if you put it on the outside of the window, he can't scrape it down. So every time he goes to the window to patrol, oh, I can't do it, I can't see out there. And after a while, he'll do it less and less. Eventually, he'll stop doing it because he can't patrol. And now we're helping him not practice the unwanted behaviors, such as being aggressive or barking and all the rest of that stuff. Um, if there's other windows and areas in the house, that we might do the same sort of thing. Um, okay, now um, the dogs basically had no rules. And uh, well, actually Bentley, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, I know a dog this breed, the same Bentley, which is why I keep on saying his name. Sorry, buddy. Nico has one rule. He's not allowed to rush out of the, uh, out of the kennel. His guardian makes him sit and wait before she says, let's go. Now when it comes to command words, dogs typically focus on one word, the first word that we say. The more words we use for command words, or the more words we use in general, the harder it is for dogs to understand. So we have to say, go potty. We want to conjugate, go potty. Well, we don't need the go part. All we have to do is just say potty. Or kennel, actually we're going to call that castle from now on. But we're just going to say just one word, not go castle, just castle. And also, a lot of people like to say good dog. Good dog when I come, when I go, when I sit up, when I lay down, when I eat my food, when I poop, when I you know, bring the toy. I hear good dog for everything. Well, good dog doesn't mean any one specific thing. It means a platitude. But here's a little secret. When it comes to dogs, attention from a human is rewarding and validating. Petting the dog is now a double positive. Ta petting the dog, looking at it, and talking to it is a triple positive. A lot of people give their dog triple or quadruple positives. What really all I have to do is look at the dog, or pet the dog, or say the dog's name, or talk to the dog, whatever it is. So when the, when, when the dog comes to us, instead of giving it a quadruple positive, just say sit. St streaming it down makes it easier, or excuse me, the dog comes to you, I would pet it and say come. Now this is a little bit of passive training, which I'm going to do right here. So uh, Nico's walking towards me on his own, come. I didn't show him my treats, I didn't entice him, I didn't ask him to come. He just did it on his own, and I petted him within three seconds. Remember, anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're reinforcing, and you have three seconds to pet, sit, or reward your dog. So he sat down, and within one second, I was petting him. Three seconds is your, is your, your maximum. A third of a second is your goal, and the faster you are petting your dog from the genesis of the behavior, the f more they'll understand it. So if every, and now, um, well, I guess we'll talk about passive training and petting with purpose. Passive training is simply waiting for the dog to do a desired action or behavior 
and then petting them to reward them for doing it and marking it by saying just the command word. Now most of us, uh, like, like I said earlier, attention itself is validating. Well, a lot of us train our dogs to misbehave because they do the wrong thing and we get up and chase them or correct them or yell at them and that's the quickest way to get our attention. As a human, I would rather have somebody ignore me than yell at me. Dogs would rather be yelled at than ignored. And so if we start paying attention to the things that dog does that we like coincidentally, like this, come. I didn't ask him to come, but the end result is something that I do like. There are times where I'm gonna ask him to come and I want him to come. This is gonna make him come when I call him more, call him the next time considerably quicker. Because now I'm rewarding him for doing the action and I'm not trying to entice him or motivate him, I'm just waiting for him to do it on his own. Every time your dog sits, pet it and say sit. Every time it lays down, pet it and say crash or whatever the word is. Um, and whenever possible, pet under the chin like this. These dogs both have some insecurity issues. If you pat a dog on top of the head, you saw his head just went down. So if I pat a dog on top of the head, down nose is an insecure body mechanic. Up nose is a proud body mechanic. If the dogs are doing things that I want, I want them to feel proud about sitting, coming, laying down, bringing me the ball, whatever it is. So all things being equal, always pet under the chin, never pat on top of the head. Now you can caress and scratch, but I find most people just kind of do this and then they and it create, especially for these dogs, we want them to feel better. We want to boost their self-esteem, not decrease it. Now, um, and say just the command word and not even good sit or good or elongating, like sit, just say it sit. Um, all right, now uh, to help flip the leader follower dynamic, I went over the importance of rules and structure. I started talking about this earlier. But dogs go through life probing to determine where boundaries and limits are. And if we don't have any rules, then it's very easily, easy for the dog to see themselves as our peer. If they see us as our peer, then listening to us is optional. But in this case, it goes beyond that. The dogs both came up and sat, uh, either nudged at, pawed at, or climbed up on the guardian or put the head right here as a way of demanding attention. Now he's licking me, he's asking for attention, but, if, but I'm, if I pet him, I'm rewarding him for something that he wants, sit. So now I wait for him to do something I like, and I call this light switch on, light switch off. Light switch off was when he was licking my hand. That wasn't what I wanted. Now if I do want to train him to do that, when he licks him, I pat him and say kiss. That's passive training as well. But what I was doing there was waiting for him to offer a desired behavior. He sat, and within that three second window, I started petting him and said the word sit. Uh, before I go into rules, I'm going to go over uh, petting with a purpose, which is kind of related to this. Petting with a purpose is simply petting your dog, giving your dog a direction to pet it. Or and let's say that the dog comes up and nudges me. It's telling me what to do. So before, the lack of rules confused the dog to think they were peers. If the dog tells me what to do and I do it, now the dog thinks it has more status than I have. And therefore, it is responsible for me. But when it tells me what to do and I don't listen, that stresses the dog out, just like a child whose parent tells him, don't run with the scissors, and the kid keeps on running with the scissors. That's gonna be dangerous and the kid might injure themselves. That's why the parents get frustrated and anxious and upset because they're worried about the child. They're not doing it, they're not angry, but they are a little bit angry because they're worried and the child's not listening to them and that creates more stress and that's related to both these dogs being stressed out. So what we're gonna do for petting with a purpose is the dog nudges me or puts his head in my crotch or paws at me or barks at me, I'm gonna give it a counter order. I'm gonna tell it to sit. It's already sitting, I'm gonna ask you to tell it to come on and sit over here. Come here, Bentley. Come. Or crash, or I could have said sit. He gave me a whole bunch of different options. Now also real quick for petting, if I pet the dog and I'm petting him, and then he gradually kind of rolls over his back and gives me, offers his belly up, that's okay. But if you start petting the dog and with one second they flip up on their back and they give you, they spread their, that's too submissive. Turn the light switch off, disengage and stop petting with the dog. That way the dog starts to learn, as soon as I'm laying relaxed and confident they're petting me, or I do a desired action, but as soon as I do something insecure, they stop petting me. Because anything your dog is doing when you pet is what you're reinforcing. So if we reward submission, that's gonna be related to a lot of the problems that we have. So for petting with a purpose is the dog comes up and nudges me, I tell it to sit. If it's already sitting, I tell it to sit over here. Or uh, lay down or do something else. After a while, the dog's gonna come start sitting in front of us to prepay for attention, because it's learned if I sit, I get attention. So now I'm gonna pro-offer that behavior in order to get the attention. Now we're training our dogs to be obedient and to offer the behaviors we want, because that's the easiest way to get our attention. If I steal the remote control, they don't do anything anymore. Come. Now, uh, they do like to uh, take, uh, take things and run around the house. One of the things I taught the dogs to do, or showed the guardian how to do, is teach dogs to drop. 
So let's say he had a piece of uh, a sock in his mouth. If I pull it away from him, that's going to make him want to hold on to it more. So when he has a low, any item, I would practice this first with low value items, stuff that they're allowed to have an A point. So let's say he has a bone in his mouth, and it's, or a toy that he's allowed to have an A point. I'm just going to hold it in front of his mouth. He's going to try to take it with the item in his mouth. Wait for him to drop it. Don't tell him to do anything. Just wait. Light switch is off. I'm waiting. As soon as you drop it, drop. Remember, every time the treat goes in the dog's mouth, they share the command word after it goes in their mouth. So first he drops it. I put the treat in his mouth, and I say the word drop to create a command. And then I build up trust in the dog because I don't try to now take the object. So the dog picks, picks up the object again, and I can practice again. Make it drop again. So what I'm doing, if the more I take it from the dog, the more they will be reluctant to give it up. The more that we condition them by holding it, then eventually the dog has underwear or remote control or something they're not allowed to have. You say drop, and they spit it out at your feet because that means I'm going to get a treat. So just training the dogs to behave how we want, a lot of us coincidentally, unintentionally train the dogs to do what we don't want. They steal our sock and we chase them. Well, that's not what we want, but we think that's the way to get our stuff. Now, he also might have a potential resource guarding issue. Now, a dog, see this is what I mean, so I immediately light switch off. Light switch on. Now the light didn't come up. Um, okay, now it's, not, it's okay for a dog to do that. If a dog just lays on its back, that's a way of saying I trust you enough to put myself at a disadvantage. But if I start petting, they do it right away. That's submissive. So I want to stop for that. Now, if a dog has a resource, like he has a bone or a toy, and his guardian goes to try to take it from him, he gets growly and he will bite her or bite anybody. Dogs with, re with resource guarding will. Well, the more that we take things away from the dog when it's guarding, the more we're going to amplify that behavior and reinforce it. So what we do instead is let's say that he is here and he has a piece of meat that he's not allowed to have or he has something that he's guarding. Well, I start walking towards him. When I get to the point where he's about to break and he's about to un go above threshold, he's gonna kind of freeze for a second. That's his first warning, you're getting too close. As Soon as he freezes, I stop and I take note of how close I am. Let's say I'm 10 feet away. I would walk away, go in the kitchen, get a high value training treat, walk back and if at 10 feet is the distance, I would stop now at 11 feet before the dog freezes. And then I would throw a treat so it lands right here, and the dog just gobbles it up, and then I turn and walk away. I don't take their stuff. What I'm, the lesson I'm sending is when you have stuff that you're guarding, when I approach, it's nothing to be alarmed about because I'm not going to take your stuff. Matter of fact, when I approach, your situation is going to be better. I'm going to drop the best treat you've ever had, and then I'm going to walk away. And you get your original stuff and the best treat you've ever had. And then next time I would approach from a different angle, but stop at that same distance. And then after I've done that a couple times, the dog seems to be more and more relaxed, then I might move to 10 feet before I throw the treat. And if the dog goes back to freezing at 10 feet, then back up at 11 feet, practice 11 feet a little bit more. But eventually you get closer and closer and closer, and eventually you'll be this close and be just able to drop the treat, and the dog's not trying to grab you or do anything. Now if you teach your dog to drop when it's low value items, like I talked about earlier, and then we also teach the dog, uh, what do you call it, uh, that I'm not here to stake your stuff by progressively getting closer and closer and offering high value items, then eventually I say drop and the dog's happy to drop because that means I'm getting something else and the human has proven to me that they're trustworthy and they're not here to gank my stuff. Shouldn't say gank. Um, all right, a little slang. Um, all right, so uh, for uh, rules that we want to incorporate, uh, the dog should uh, not be allowed to, uh, I love the rule, uh, the, what the guardian is doing with the kennel, that's awesome. The guardian should make sure she's eating something first and when, when it's meal time, both dogs are out of the kitchen. The human who's feeding them is gonna eat a couple bites first, something like five or more bites or a real meal. Then he's older, so we're gonna invite Bentley to come in. When Bentley gets in the kitchen, uh, uh, Nico is not allowed in the kitchen. And that way Bentley doesn't have to look over his shoulder. Bentley eats really fast. A lot of these dogs do this really fast so that, so that another dog can't try to take my stuff. But also if I eat fast, because right now they eat at the same time, well then I can go stand next to, to uh, uh, to Nico and hopefully intimidate him and, or if he walks away I can steal his food. So now eating is the most primarily important activity for dogs so if the guardian just gets in the habit of she goes in the kitchen, she prepares food, puts it in the bowl, the dog can out in the kitchen. There's nothing blocking them but air and the dog's self-control. Developing self-control through delayed gratification is a wonderful thing to do with dogs. So then, when, then the guardian is going to lean back against the counter, eat a carrot, piece of celery, a chip, something that's crunchy that takes five or more bites or her real meal. When she gets done, then she's going to invite him to come in. Now, she says that pizza and sushi are her two favorite foods, favorite dishes. So basically, when Bentley takes his first bite of food for two months, 
I want to say the word sushi one time in a normal tone of voice. When Bentley hears the word sushi, there's food in his mouth. So after a while, sushi means food for me. When uh, Nico hears the word sushi, there's no food in his mouth and he's out of the kitchen. So sushi does not mean food for him. When he gets done eating, he has to leave the kitchen. Once Nico, uh, uh, Bentley's out of the kitchen, then we invite Nico in. Nico gets to go eat at his bowl without Bentley there. And so this way the humans see that the, uh, the dogs see the humans are in charge of this primarily important activity. And just by adding a little bit of structure, we help, every time we feed the dogs, the, the dogs now respect us a little bit more. And they see the human is in charge as opposed to the dogs being in charge. Um, I also showed the guardian a focus exercise. Now when you're doing the focus exercise, remember at first it's one second, one second. But eventually one second, 15 seconds. And you want to get to that point within, within seven days. So when you're practicing, she's probably practiced with each dog three times a day, in about a minute, two minutes tops, and practice in different parts of the place. Don't always practice just here. Dogs don't generalize well. They need to do things in different locations in order to kind of figure it out. Uh, but if you do that enough, then eventually the dogs are, you know, with the feeding and all the rest of the stuff, the dogs are going to start seeing more and, and respecting the humans more as the authority figure. Um, and we're using passive training by saying that command word when they take their first bite of food. When, when, uh, when uh, Nico takes his first bite of food, we're going to say the word pizza. And eventually, the dogs will learn to stay out of the kitchen, and you won't have to be in the kitchen. You can be sitting here watching TV, and, and they're waiting outside the kitchen, and you say, sushi. And uh, Bentley goes over and eats his food, and you're watching TV. He comes out of the kitchen, and then you tell Nico to go in. Don't do that too early, though, because Bentley probably going to eat Nico's food. Um, and put the food dishes a little bit further apart so they're not right next to each other. Um, for the focus exercise, um, sorry, I, I jumped around. Um, I want to go one second, one second, and doing it all over the place. But each time we do it, maybe the second time we do, and we do this for 12 treats, second time I do it, one second, two seconds for the second movement for all 12 treats. And then I go to a different location, and this is not in a row, this is sprinkled throughout your day. Next location, one second, three seconds for that final, uh, before you, and say focus after the treat goes in the dog's mouth. You're loving this. Um, the idea is we want to work our way up to 15 seconds within a week by doing it all over the place. The next thing I would do is I would go out and practice on your deck here. The Guardian has a nice deck. She doesn't use it very often. When we go outside, now there's sight, sounds, and smells. There's more distractions. It's harder for the dogs to filter out and focus. So we want to prepare the dog for that by practicing outside, but without a bunch of dogs or people around. This deck is great because nobody else is around, but it still has the sights and sounds and smells of outside. So then when we do that, I might go back to one second, one second for maybe two or three treats, and one second, two seconds for a couple treats, and one second, three seconds for a couple treats. The idea is to gradually elongate it and get back to that 15 second mark. Eventually though, when we're walking, yeah, and we're walking with Nico, and we're walking, we see a dog come around the corner. It's a block away, but Nico sees it. Well, I know that Nico is dog reactive. So as we, walk, as we get closer, eventually we're getting to the point where Nico's going to stop or start staring at that other dog. He's being aware, but he's, he's going to be staring intently. That's getting close to his breaking point. So at that point, we say focus, he looks up at us, we hold the tree to our nose, and we turn and we walk this way instead of walking down the sidewalk. And the dog walks with us and is paying attention to me because the other dog is so far away, it's not an immediate threat. If you try doing this with the dog too close, he won't focus on you. So that's why we have to uh, initiate the focus exercise when the dog's far enough away. And then basically that allows us to move down the street or around a car or around a shrub or something like that. And then we get there, then we might practice a little focus exercise a couple times while we give the other dog the opportunity to pass us. Or we walk around a car so that they're blocking the vision. And then when we come back around, the dog has been focusing on us and then the other dog that he was gonna react to has already passed us and has walked away as no longer a threat. Now the bat training that we went over above is really designed, and this is something I want the guard, that's one something I want the guardian to do a couple times a week. If she has friends with dogs, that's even better. Because that way you control the environment. But sometimes I go to a park that just has a lot of dogs, not a dog park, that would be horrible. But a park that has a lot of dogs, and if I see somebody walking along the path and there's no other dogs around, I might just walk with my dog behind that dog. What we want to do for bat training is help the dog practice being around the other dogs without being so intense that they feel like they have to react. I think both of these dogs are a little insecure and they think that they're in charge and I think they're stressed out. I think the combination of those is why they're lashing out. Uh, the guardian didn't sit passive training. The guardian, guardian didn't create the problem. Oh, sure, long night last night in, in uh, Laguna Niguel. 
Uh, but the dog, uh, that, uh, dog uh, the guardian didn't teach the dog to do these things, but it's developed the end of the last. And so we can help the dog get over these. Now, uh, I'd also like the guardian to go to YouTube, pick eight commands, and each Sunday or Monday or Saturday, crash. Whatever the work day of the week it is, put one dog in the kennel, take the other dog in the other room, and practice the ex and teach the dog a new trick, and then and then t switch dogs, teach the other dog the new trick. It's best to teach them separately. Then all week long we're gonna practice bang your dead, bang your dead, bang your dead. At the end of the week, we're gonna pick a new one and teach them new tricks. We do that for eight weeks in a row. Now the dogs are gonna have eight new commands, which is gonna boost their self-esteem. It's gonna help them respect their guardian a little bit more and give the guardian eight new ways to redirect the dog's attention. Now, I'm a big comp uh, proponent of giving the dog fun command words. If I want my dog to do this, I don't say lay down, I say crash. If I want my dog to go forward, I say charge. If I want, uh, you know, my dog's, word, one of my dog's word is feast. So coming up with these fun command words, because dogs can read a human facial expression, they're the only animal on the planet besides humans that can do that. So if you have friends come over and you say chill and your dog flops down the ground, your friend's gonna laugh and giggle, or castle, or palace, or whatever it is for the dog bed or the, uh, the dog uh, kennel. And the dog sees the humans are laughing when they hear the command or hear the dog, see the dog do it. The dog is more motivated to want to do that activity again. And motivation is really important for all of us. So one of the things I'd like the guardian to do is come up with a list of official command words. A lot of us use a whole different versions of the command word as if the dogs speak English, which they do not. So come, come here, over here, dog's name, slap my thigh, dog's nickname, and a whistle all mean to me that the dog should come to me. But to a dog, that's all now eight, seven or eight unique specific commands the dog has to remember. So it's much easier for us if we just have these one word commands and we always say come, we always say sit, we always say crash or whatever it is. By doing this consistently, we put the dog in a position to succeed. And that makes it easier for them to perform the way that we want and then everybody's happy. Um, let me see, um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, other rules, um, the, guard, the dog should not be within seven feet of the humans who are eating. They should not be in the kitchen when we're preparing food. Um, they should eventually, when they're allowed to buy out on the furniture, be allowed on the furniture with an invitation. I think that's our uh, alert that we have somebody uh, waiting to help uh, to work with us. Okay, well, um, I'm probably forgetting some things, and if I am, that's okay. If I'm gonna get, I, the guardian has my primary cell phone number. If I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going wonderfully. So if there are problems, make sure you let me know. I can usually help you out. Thousands of dog videos that I've done with other people I can share with you. Sometimes we need to uh, make adjustments to the things that we went over. Sometimes there's just questions that you have. Everybody's a dog expert. I literally am a dog expert and get paid to do this. If somebody tells you, I've had one client call me the other day like, I heard what your dog had blood in his mouth, it's bloodthirsty forever. No, completely BS. But everybody hears all this stuff and they think they're an expert. I am an expert and I'm available to you. So I don't charge for that. I want you to call me. If I don't hear from you, like I said, I assume everything's going great. Nico. Oh, I um, remember for this, for the hand, and I, to make him sit, I go in an arc over the head, then I lower it, let him lick it off my hand, and I say, come, and I tickle under this chin. Come up here, buddy. Nico, come here. Oh, a little jealousy works, yes. Nico, come here. Come here, buddy. All right, this is Nico, this is Bentley, and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, Everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.